God. But no, in 2021, if we want to be faithful to what God's doing right here, right now, then we have to know his story and how our lives find its role in that. And so we've been tracking along over the last, uh, I think it's been like almost 30 weeks, if not a little bit more, through the story of God, starting with the God who is good, who created everything good, right, and beautiful, and then human beings that he created to cultivate all the hidden potentials of his creation. He put them right there in the center of the world he had created and said, make order of this, cultivate it, see what you can do with what I've given you, uh, live under my reign, it's the best possible way to live, uh, and then you'll flourish. But if you don't, take the fruit, eat it, you're surely going to die, and death will reign. Uh, the human beings, right, rebelled against God's rule. They thought there was a better life than the one that he had for them. And so they ate the fruit, and as soon as they did, death fell into the world. The world fell under a curse. But God didn't leave the world without hope. He called one man, Abram, and said, out of you, I'm going to make a great nation. Uh, uh, last weekend, we went camping for one night and one night only. With five kids, that's about what we could do. Right? We just we were playing the odds. We didn't backpack in. We straight up backed the car in and unloaded everything, put the big tent up, right, and had everybody hopefully stay warm. Uh, but if you go camping at night uh, in Arizona and you walk outside and look up, something miraculous happens, even better than being in Cave Creek where they can't have any lights out. You look up in the sky and you see all the stars scattered throughout the sky. And so Caden and I were walking uh, while we waited for the littles to be a little bit quieter and more asleep um, than they were. And just talked about how that showed off God's promise to be faithful, to finish what he started in the world. And he was going to do that through Abraham and his lineage, the nation of Israel. And we took some of the stories looking at how God was faithful to Israel all the time in all the ways that he said he would be, but how Israel was very often unfaithful, that they didn't live into what God had called them to be. Uh, this is the act of the story that we call promise, uh, where God's promises are true, even though Israel is unfaithful to do their part. And so what we see happening is that God calls out through the prophets and he tells the prophets, hey, would you call out to the nations and let Israel know that they've failed to live into the calling the way that they were supposed to. They've failed to be the people that God have called them to be. And because of that, they're going to be under judgment. Because of that, they're going to be scattered. But don't worry, I promise you, I will still be faithful to do what I said I would do in sending a rescuer, a deliverer. One who would serve not only Israel, but be there to reign over the nations. And then he goes silent for 400 years until onto the scene comes Jesus. And that's the act of the story, act four, redemption, where we are today. In particular, we're coming to the part of the story where Jesus, God's own son, has come onto the scene. He's announced good news. The kingdom of God's here. He's done a bunch of miracles. He showed off how beautiful it is when the reign of God invades this world. He's done uh, things like bringing dead people back to life, giving hungry people food, giving blind people back their sight, making people who couldn't walk be able to walk again, taking families that were shattered by death and reuniting them and healing them, taking the messed up parts of people's lives and giving them brand new purpose that was back in line with what he created them to be. He's done all of this. But the whole time, he's been on a trajectory to come to Jerusalem, the capital city, the place where the nations converged, the place where the reign of Rome was most felt in the nation of Israel. And last week, Jake taught us about how Jesus showed up riding on a donkey, right? Not a mighty warrior horse, but a humble donkey. And everybody just went crazy shouting, Hosanna, son of David, save us. And one of the unfortunate things with uh, flying so high above the story of God is that we don't get to see all the particulars of this story unfolding. Because as the week went on, the religious rulers and the Romans got really scared and sketched out by Jesus. And they said, we have got to put an end to this. We are going to assassinate this guy. And they brought in one of Jesus' followers, a guy named Judas, and promised him 30 pieces of silver if he'd arrange a sign so that they could come and get Jesus. 
so they could pull him off the scene in the darkness and their plan was to assassinate him and figure out a way to do that because they would not have somebody uprooting the political system for the Romans and they would not have somebody uprooting the religious system for the Pharisees. And so they came together with this plot. And so tonight in our story in John 13 is Thursday night of that week. And I don't know if you guys ever do this when you read the Bible, uh, try to play it out in your mind like it's a movie. So here's how the framing's going in my brain, right? You guys can do it your own way. You, some of you are cartoons. Some of you might be anime. I'm sure you still love Jesus. Like there's lots of options that we can do with this. But in my mind, it goes like this. The, the camera's angle starts out wide outside the wall of Jerusalem. And it pans super wide and it narrows in probably definitely a drone doing it because that's just how we shoot these things these days, right? For one continuous ongoing scene. And so this is one scene, not chopped, uh, coming in from the outside, zooming in over the wall of Jerusalem because the gate's shut because it's nighttime and we're keeping people out. Coming through the streets, over the cobblestones, weaving in and out of a few windows to show what's going on at night. A mom's putting a kid to sleep. A dad's teaching a lesson to his son. A couple's having a conversation on the porch. And then you sweep up the stairs to this upper room where 13 people are gathered around the table having their Passover feast a little bit early. And so you're a little curious. It's Thursday night, not Friday night. It's the night before the Passover, and these people are sitting down to the meal. And if you're not a John 13 yet, I really don't know how to help you because you probably won't get there. Um, we're going to keep and start reading right there. So John 13, it reads this way. It was just before the Passover festival. Uh, Jesus knew that the hour had come to him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Uh, John in his architecting or uh, constructing this telling of the night before Jesus died is very careful to make sure that we all know the time stamps. Uh, these are important. Like the messages you get from your friends, you can, you can pull them over and see when it was sent because the context of when it takes place matters, right? If somebody asked you something the night before and you don't see it till the next morning, they might not want to watch a movie with you at 7 a.m. So you want to make sure that it was sent the previous night. You're like, oh, that's when that was sent. That's helpful. John wants us to know, hey, as you're tracking the story of God, I need you to see some timestamps. One, it's before the Passover. Uh, as we were going through the story of God, Mike Zins taught us about the Passover, right? This mighty act of a rescuing God to redeem his people out of slavery in Egypt. This moment was monumental in the life of Israel. They regularly looked back to the reality that God was a rescuing God who had brought them out of slavery and set them free as his people. They would sacrifice a lamb in order to commemorate that night and the way they had to eat a meal in a rush as they headed out of Egypt and into the future God had for them. Uh, make no mistake, Jesus has timed out his steps so he would be at this place at this time to be a part of this story. It's beautiful. Also, it says it was the uh, less than 24 hours before he'd be laid in a tomb. Like this was literally 24 hours before Jesus was gonna die. And uh, for those of us that are like, yeah, but did he really know that? It says he did. He knew that his time had come. In John up to this point, we missed the beauty of this. He had constantly said, starting with David, when he read in John 4, if you remember correctly, he preached on the uh, miracle where Jesus turned the water into wine, which we love. That's Jesus' first miracle. We love that our God is a God of abundance. But remember what he told his mom, woman, it's not yet my time. And all through the book of John, he's been saying, it's not my time. It's not my time. It's not my time. But now at this moment, it says it was his time. And so as a reader, you perk up and you're like, oh, this one's different. This one's different. He was aware of his status he knew where he had come from, and he knew where he was going. Uh, catch this, people of the story. He knew where the story started, and he knew where it ended, and it allowed him to live faithfully in the moment. 
I mean, that's a sermon in itself. We're going to keep going, but you can write that one down and come back to that later because that one's good. He knew where he came from, and he knew where the story ended, and it allowed him to stand faithful in the moment he was in. He also knew that his love was going to be betrayed. So the backdrop of the story, the character settings, It says that the the enemy had already come to Judas and deceived him, and he would be betraying Jesus. So Jesus is entering this moment literally not just with the weight of the world, but with the weight of world history on his shoulders. He's there with his friends in the final moments of his life as he knows it, and he knows there's one person in this 13-person group who is going to betray him. He's going to turn his back on him. He's going to hand him over. He knows what he's about to go through. All those timestamps matter for us as we come through this story. He knew he was returning to God. Keep reading verse four. So he got up from the meal, and took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Uh, This moment, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it, but it was absolutely startling, Uh, uh, shocking, scandalous. Uh, This was him enacting what had been said about him in statement form before, that he loved them well to the very end. Uh, Jesus in this role was taking on the, the role of both host. He was the one taking responsibility to make sure that the feet of his disciples were washed, but then he's also taking the role of a slave to do that work for them. And John's painting a vivid picture of the kind of Savior who saves his people. The kind of God who reigns right now. It's a vivid picture. Something that startled me this week, I think I've always read this particular text uh, in the way, and again, like, it's probably because my mind goes to movies and I'm playing it out, and it's like Jesus looking around saying, like, all right, well, who's going to wash feet, right? Like, are you going to do it? You're going to do it? You're going to do it? Everybody's kind of like avoiding eye contact because there's no servant there. You know how that happens, right? When there's dishes to be done maybe at the house after a party, right? Somebody's got to clean up. And if Mike Zins isn't there because he's the only one who loves to wash dishes, just with a cheerful, I love it. But if he's not there and Josh Duran, right? They're the two that wash dishes at my house. So uh, if they're not there, everybody else kind of makes eye, doesn't make eye contact, right? Like, you know what I'm talking about? There's work to be done. There's serving to happen. Everybody's kind of looking around. And then he's like, all right, cool. I'll teach some people. I'll do it. Uh, the thought that struck me this week uh, came from reading the Bible, which is shocking, right? It says he know, Jesus knew that his father, verse 3, had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. He was aware of his status. He was aware of his identity. He knew full well how his reigning power was absolutely supreme, right? Everything was under his feet. He knew exactly who he was and what he was able to do and the authority that he had. And the next word, if you read it in the NIV, is so. It's saying in light of all that, so he took He got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. Here's the thought that wrecked me a little bit this week. Uh, What if Jesus did that, not because he had to or nobody hadn't yet, but because he wanted to? Like, let's put a little little humanity on Jesus in this moment. I mean, none of us would have excused, like, if he would have gone into that upper room and then gone off in a side room, shut the door, and kind of was just in there having his own moment, none of us would be like, yo, what was he doing? When we look back, we're like, oh, that's the night before he died. That's clearly he had to work some stuff out, right? He was kind of in that room, shutting it down, working it through, getting ready to go. Or maybe if he's a little bit short that night, is any of us in that place? I I know I can be so often when there's pressure on me, right, when I feel the stress of a situation that I know hurts and it's painful, and I get, I get a little short. My responses come back a little harsher, you know what I mean? But it's like, oh, that's the night before he dies. That totally makes sense. One of his best friends is literally going to betray him over to a foreign ruling empire. I get it. You're allowed to be a little short. But it says, so he began to wash their feet. What if it was before his body was shred and his blood was shed on a cross that he actually wanted to physically get down and show love to the men that he was going to send out into the world? He knew how confused they were about to be. He knew how hurt they were about to be. He knew how scared they were about to be. 
And so he bends down next to them and begins to use his power to serve others in a way that would have shocked them. Is that hyperbole? Is Kevin just making stuff up again? I don't think so. After that, he poured water, verse 5, into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around them. He came to Simon Peter, uh, who always says what he wants and gives all of us hope that we too can be followers of Jesus because he gets it wrong so regularly. But he says, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Right, going around the line, going to wash some feet. Wash, 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 gets to Peter. Peter looks up, whoa, 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 whoa. Lord, you're going to wash my feet? And Jesus answers, unless I wash you, you'll have no part of me. I mean, it's a pretty dark answer, right? Like, yo, if I don't wash you, you don't even have a place at the table. Just, Jesus answered. Uh, then, Simon, no, then Simon says, right? Then Lord, Simon Peter replies. Then Lord, then master. Then, then the master, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my heads and my hand as well. Like, like wash all of me, right? Like, if that's what you're doing and that's what it means to be a part of your family, that's what it means to sit at your table, yo, I'm here, give me a shower. Right, like take that basin and just dump it on my dome, right? That's what he just said. I need it all then because I want to be with you, all in, enjoying you, right? And then Jesus has to answer him again. Uh, hold on a second there, bud. Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Uh, their whole body is clean and you are clean. Uh, those who Jesus had called were already clean. They didn't need the same soul cleansing, but they did need some ongoing maintenance because they still get a little dirty, not all the way, but, but the feet still needed some work. And I love this picture. Look up at me real quick. Uh, some of us uh, think that we have the heart of Jesus because we're always serving others and we're doing things and we have the right answers and we're always giving of ourselves for the sake of others. But here's the deal, and I don't want us to miss this. Humility isn't just present in serving it's being humble enough to let Jesus serve us. There is a special, precious place of having our hands open to receive. And it is a very vulnerable place, uh, not just to receive grace the first time, because that's when we remember how messed up we are and how much we really need a rescuer, a redeemer, a savior. And, but then some of us, very, uh, as we follow Jesus, we end up in Peter's place. We're like, yo, God, you're too great. Maybe I'm too small. God, I don't really need this. God, like, I have this weird relationship where I, I stop somewhere along the way realizing I needed to receive from you in order to continue on with the work that I have to do. Humility is found not just when we serve others. For some of us, that's actually the power position. Are you tracking with me? Sometimes when we serve, when we have something to offer, but then what is it, when it flip it around? What about, this is one of the hardest lessons, what about when we need to receive from others in the body or for God himself? Do we create the space to receive or do we keep going at a pace saying, there's too much I gotta do, I, I can't take this moment? There's a humility in being able to receive and even more than a humility in being able to receive, I want us to realize that that's needed for us to do the work that God's called us to do in the mission that he sent us on. This is a little bit of a lengthy quote. I could put it somewhere else. Um, but read this. Uh, God calls the church to be a sent community of people who no longer live for themselves, but instead live to participate with him in his redemptive purposes. God's people say amen on that one, right? That's good. However, 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 people will have neither the passion or the strength to live as a countercultural society for the sake of others if they are not, and I'd insert themselves, transformed by the way of Jesus. If the church is to go and be, then we must make certain that we are a spirit-formed community that has the spiritual capacity to impact the lives of others. And that will not happen if we're not regularly receiving from Jesus. Right, right. Yes, we need to be cleansed one time, but Jesus is telling Peter, that already happened for you. You don't need that again. But sometimes you get a little crusty around the feet. Sometimes there's some buildup between the toes. Sometimes there's a little mess that you stepped in that still needs to be cleaned off. Let me do that too. Somewhere along there, Jesus stopped talking about real feet, right? Though not less than that, but more. Uh, let's keep reading. 
Then Jesus said, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that's why he said, not every one of you was clean. And when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Uh, Powerful words. When he finished doing what he had to do, he returned to the place that he had come from. Uh, Something that's interesting, the next few times, for some reason, John highlights the clothes Jesus is wearing. This is the time where he voluntarily sheds his upper layer in order to serve his friends. In order to demonstrate love to others, he takes off that cloak, bends down, and uses a towel to wash feet. The next time his clothes are mentioned, it's when they strip him off and put a purple robe around him and say, all right, hail him, king of the Jews. Here's the clothes you're going to wear. And then they put the clothes back on him, on his bloodied back. And the next time you read about his clothes, they're stripping him down to serve the many. And then they get, cast lots over his clothes because they don't want to rip them up because then who gets to use them? Let's keep them all together. We'll throw some dice, see who gets to keep Jesus' clothes. And then the next time his clothes are used are when he's coming out in the resurrection and it says that they're all lined up, even the little linen thing that was over his face folded off to the side and he pieced out because he's alive. Uh, John's telling a story, even with the clothes, that they are a demonstration of Jesus's pathway towards new life, right? He willingly gives up this right in order to serve his friends. And then in that same way, when people think they're stripping him of that, he's still doing that same thing, serving his friends. And then as he resurrects, inviting others into new creation life, we see those set to the side. He's telling a beautiful story, even with those little side facts. Something else I want us to see from this little part, even though he wasn't clean, Jesus still served Judas. There is nothing in the text that Jesus said, wash your feet, wash your feet, wash your feet, wash your feet, look up at Judas and goes, not you today, bro. I know you. Skip, keep going. There's nothing in the text that says that. It says that he bent down and washed Judas' feet in the same way as he washed the others because he knew he needed the same even though he was going to betray him. A few years ago, I had my first experience with a geo-fenced shopping cart. I didn't know what geofencing was at the time. I just know that I was pushing my shopping cart along, full of my stuff, pushing it along the road, right? And my car was parked apparently outside of the geofence, because what happens when you push your cart along? Right? You hit that barrier, and you're like, it's like God himself is like, you shall go no further, and you just fall over, right? Geofence shopping carts going along, bangs into it. I'll go no further. That's the line. And that shopping cart will follow its master, the algorithm, and stop right there. When it comes to serving, some of us, I think, have geofenced our hearts and the boundaries of where we stop somewhere different than where it's supposed to be. In this particular case, in the shopping lot, it was short of my car. It's supposed to go to the end of the lot for the shopping center. When it comes to serving, though, I think some of us have geofenced how far we're willing to go to serve in places that Jesus never intended it to be. Uh, what about my enemies? What about those who lie to me? What about those who misuse me? What about those who want to take advantage of me? What about those who betray me and have betrayed me? What about those who emotionally... Jesus, uh, we see time and time again serving, living, among even those who were enemies, calling his followers to do the same. So yes, we love and we serve even those who maybe we want to put on the other side of that fence. And there's nothing real boundary. We just don't go there, right? We just just stop short of it. Or maybe we say, God, I'll serve you with my time, but not with my money. And we make that distinction. Or maybe we flip it. God, I'll serve you with my money, but not with my time. Uh, Maybe we say, uh, God, I'll serve you, I'll serve those who are like me, but those who are very different than me, it's kind of awkward, it's kind of inconvenient, and I don't really know what to do around them, and so I stop short when I don't know what to do around other people. God, I'll serve those I like. God, I'll serve those who never betray me, definitely not those who do. And I think what we see in the story of Jesus washing all the disciples' feet is that he is including all sorts of people for his followers to love and to serve. So we can't do what that one guy did. We goes, all right, well, well then who am I supposed to serve? Because they would remember back to this night and be like, well, if he served Judas too, because they all were betrayed in the same way. 
I wonder how much that stuck with them as they were planting the early church and they came to loving those that were on the margins of the community in the cities where they had been sent. And how many times they sat down and be like, yeah, you remember that time Jesus washed all our feet? You think that means we gotta go over there too? Yes, remember, he's done that for us. We do it for others. We'll wrap up the text here. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I think he's talking real feet, but he's also talking, you know what I mean, loving one another in tangible actions, wherever that may lead, no matter how grimy, insignificant, or overlooked it is. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who has sent him. And now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. From this chunk, a few things I want you to see. One, we have a master and we don't get to do what we want to do. This is very uh, uh, anti-American. Uh, This is very anti our freedom. This is very anti Arizonian, right? Like, I have my freedom to do exactly what I want to do. And Jesus is saying, No, 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 no. I am your master, and here's what I'm telling you to do. If you say, I am your Lord, that means I get to direct your steps. If you say that I am your Lord, I get to shape how you use your finances. If you say that I'm your Lord, I get to shape what you think of sexuality. If I am your Lord, then I shape what you think of power. If I am your Lord, then I shape what you think of gathering together with other believers. If I am your Lord, then I shape how you live your everyday life. And I'm telling you, use what I've given you to serve others. You have always been blessed to be a blessing. This heralds all the way back to Genesis 12, where God said the same exact thing to Abram. I'm going to bless you, and through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. A war is waged in the kingdom of God with a towel in hand, not from a throne. And then here's a part that I think some of us might be a little bit uncomfortable with as well, if this hasn't already messed up all your categories. A blessing in this story is tied to doing something. Did you guys catch that? That final verse, right? What does he say? He says, uh, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. I think some of us have, have, do anybody here feel a little uneasy where you're like, hold on a second, like I thought we got the blessing because of Jesus and all that he's done, and now like I'm supposed to do something in order to be blessed? Like it starts to raise some of those things because we've said very clearly that it's not what you do that makes you right with God, it's what Jesus has done that makes you right with God, right? It's our faith that Jesus has lived the perfect life, died a death in our place, rose again offering new life, and then he invites us to participate in that work. Like that's what makes us right with God, not what we do. And I want to I wanna parse this out for us because it matters because I think some of us have misunderstood what blessing is and others of us have misunderstood obedience and it actually plays out in our life in a negative way. Uh, first, what is blessing? A blessing is flourishing and participating in what it truly looks like to be human. It doesn't mean you get a bigger bank account. It doesn't mean you have less suffering in your life. It doesn't mean that you never get cancer. It doesn't mean that your life is forever on the easy path if you just do what's right. That's not what blessing is. All throughout scripture, blessing is God stating it is good. This is the way it's meant to be. And so he says, if you live like I'm telling you to live, if you serve one another, then you will be living in a way that is actually more human than taking from others and your life will be categorically better quality because of that. You will be more fully human as my disciple. Like you will be able to enjoy a flourishing life with a minimal bank account. You will be able to enjoy a flourishing life and still have to pay for Hulu with ads, right? Like you can't have all the bells and whistles. You still might be a really, you know what I mean? You might have a flourishing life even though you're sick. You might have a flourishing life even though someone betrays you. You can have a flourishing life even when there's pain and suffering if you're living this way. And that's why I want you to do it because I want you to enjoy a full and flourishing life. 
He's gonna go on and unpack. And again, we missed this. If you got time this week, read John 14 through 17, the next chapters. He's gonna unpack what this looks like to love God and obey his commandments. Love God, enjoy a flourishing life. Stay connected to Jesus and you're gonna bear fruit. He does all that in the next chapters and it's beautiful. But when it comes to doing things, uh, again, I think some of us have misunderstood this because we, we sometimes think that if I, if I think these things, then I've done it. Like we run it through in our head. What is a good idea? What is a way I can serve? How should I be postured towards my enemy? And we wrestle through and we think, I should love my enemy. That's what Jesus said. I should pray for my enemy. That's what Jesus said. And we think about these things and we're like, cool, we're good then, right? On with my life. And Jesus is like, no, no, no. Doing means doing. Uh, it's not just feeling a certain way. It's not like, oh man, I feel bad when I look at people that have needs. Like I, I feel moved to empathy when I realize that there's people who are hurting or marriages that are on the rocks or people that have financial needs that I could actually meet or I realize that there's people who have X, Y, or Z. Man, that's really tough. Maybe I'll even you know, tweet about it or throw like a story, maybe not a whole post, but a story on Instagram. But when we just think about it or we feel it, that's not the same as doing it. The followers of Jesus are always meant to be marked by tangible actions of obedience to the way of the kingdom of God. There is no separation where we just think about it, feel a certain way, and then continue on with life. For us, we are still in that cycle. We're still in that circle. Uh, We are still those to whom Jesus says, all right, here's the example I've set for you. Go and do the same for each other. It's still the same. Uh, If you guys want to write this statement down, the suffering servant serves us selflessly, then sends us to serve others in the same way. Nailed it. You guys can take that one home and say it around the table a few times. Uh, See if you get the tongue ready. Just turn to one other person and try to say that sentence. Go ahead and go for it. This totally fails everything they teach you in seminary. Now switch partners. Somebody else do it. Sally sells seashells by the seashore. Every part of this sentence matters. And I know it's got a lot of S's in it, but that's because I want you to keep running it through your head trying to say it so that it goes from here down to here maybe a little bit. The selfless servant serves us. Uh, We will never be the type of people who serve others if we do not remember that the selfless servant, the suffering servant, first served us. What do I mean? Like, How in the world did Jesus do that? Like, can you imagine bending down to wipe crap out of the toes of the dude that was about to sell you over to be stripped, murdered, beaten, and killed? How do you do that? I think that answer is scrolled up to to verse 3 and in verse 4 where it says that same line, and I don't want us to miss that. He knew where he had come from, and he was about to go to be with the Father where he was going, and it allowed him to stay faithful. What I want us to also see is that we have to be served by Jesus. If we're going to be the kind of people who are sent out of this place to serve others, and you best believe that is where the commissioning is going, because there are people who are hurting, who are lost, and who are dying, and who need Jesus. And that's not to guilt you, that's a reality statement. That there are people who live in your neighborhood who desperately need the good news of Jesus. There's people on our streets who desperately need a meal. There's people who need clothing. There's people who need a friend. There's people who need the body of Christ to come alongside them and offer the hope that we have because the kingdom of God is real. There is, that is coming. But before we get there, where do you need to let Jesus serve you? If your comfort zone is in doing for others, uh, what is it that you need from him? What are the areas where you need him to wash? Where have you gotten dusty and are need in the cleansing power of Jesus right now? Uh, Take a moment. Let your heart rate settle. And open your hands and your heart to receive from him and submit to the work he wants to do. Maybe it's forgiveness for all the things that you've been hiding that nobody else knows about. And you're like, Jesus, I need you to wash me for freedom. Maybe it's the anger that's been building up, the resentment that's been building up 
the isolation that you keep retreating back into. And you're like, Jesus, I need you to draw me back into your community. I need you to wash these parts of me that I can't seem to scrub myself. Because that's what we want to do so bad, isn't it? We want to scrub it ourselves. And Jesus is saying, no, no, no. I still have to wash you. Yes, I know you're redeemed. Yes, I know you're reconciled, right? Yes, I know you're healed and a part of my family and you are forever marked in the kingdom of God. And that's really good news. But the ongoing good news is that I still need to be washing you regularly. Where's that area where you need that? The next two points, Caden helped me with the transition, so they're gonna be a little flashier. Uh, we serve one another. Uh, this week, what if we ask the question, or maybe even before you come to the table and say, God, I'm not coming to the table until you show me one way that I can serve someone else this week. Who or how can you be serving? And the beautiful part is that, that God never sets us up quid pro quo or like, hey, all right, so if you do this for me, then I'll do this for you. And so who are the people who are most likely to serve me back? That's where I'm going to go and serve because then I get mine, you get yours, and we're all good. Jesus actually does the exact opposite. He goes, who are the people who are least likely to pay you back? Go serve them because I've already served you. And that's where it's connected to that first piece. If we're not being filled up by the ongoing presence and the power of Jesus who washes us and serves us, we will never be able to pour that out for others. But if we are, we will find that we are able to run the race with endurance and not give up because it gets hard. Because believe this, this is hard. Obedience sometimes is really hard. Sometimes I don't want to. And I have to make a decision like Jesus is Lord even when I want to be. But asking this question, who or how can we serve others that are part of the body of Christ and then the last one, how do your gifts and blessings line up with the needs of the world? We serve the world. This isn't something by adding Judas into this. It wasn't just people who were a part of the Christian community. It was those who willingly placed themselves outside of it and are actually uh, proactively working against it in this story. So that's a pretty wide range of people that we get to love and serve. But where do my giftings and the blessings I've received line up with the needs of the world? If you will meditate on that question for 15 minutes this week, I guarantee that something will bubble up. I can't make many guarantees. But I'm pretty sure if you're sitting before the face of Jesus, Spirit saying, all right, God, where do the blessings that I've received and the gifts that I have, where do they intersect with some needs in this world? And how can I be a part of what you're doing? I'm like 99.9999999% sure Jesus will answer that one. But again, we'll only be able to do that with endurance if we are being served by Jesus and realizing once again that he has already done so much for us. How could we not hand that over to others? It doesn't have to bend our will, but it melts our hearts when we realize that Jesus' body was broken. That's how far he went to serve. His blood was shed. That's how far he went to love. And then he pours that out on us and invites us to do the same for others. The question is, will we be faithful to the work he's given us to do, to love and serve even as he did? Will you pray with me? Jesus, we are grateful, grateful that you love us, grateful that you have served us. When we think of all the ways, all the ways that we've betrayed you, right? Like none of us are just the disciple who always gets it. How many times have we traded our allegiance to you for allegiance to another and yet you still love us, yet you still wash us, yet you still serve us? And even looking back at the cross, oh, we realize the great the great debt that we had that needed to be paid and you graciously and willfully offered yourself in our stead. That the hope for humanity and the hope for a healed world, you freely give. And then you not only set an example, but you empower us to do the same. 
Uh, Jesus, would Missio Mesa be the kind of people who regularly remember that you have rescued us, that you have redeemed us, and then you've released us out to do that work in the world of loving and serving in your name. Not just those who seem like they deserve it, not just those who seem like they've done enough to prove themselves, but anyone to whom you send us. God, would we be people who won't feel the weight of obligation, but the joy of getting to live in what it fully means to be human as we give of ourselves, even as you did. This is gonna hurt, it's gonna cost, but we stand and say we believe it is worth it because you are worthy. And we ask this in your name, Jesus, in the power of the Spirit, amen. Amen.